Welcome. We are grateful to have all of you present for this webinar, part of a series presented by the United Methodist Association of Retired Clergy and Friends, commonly known as UMARC. Tonight, we focus on the long delayed, but potentially momentous 2024 General Conference scheduled for next April in Charlotte, North Carolina. We exist, UMARC, due to the generosity of donors who believe with us that inclusivity is fundamental to the ecclesiology of the church. Or to paraphrase a famous theologian, Emil Bruner, inclusivity exists to the church as fire exists to burning. The Church of Jesus Christ can only be faithful in its mission and ministry when it practices inclusion of all people and rejects exclusionary policies. UMARC was formed after the election of Bishop Karen Olivito and her assignment to the Mountain Sky area. As retired pastors, we have been determined to support her and all LGBTQ plus persons in our church and society. We are champions of human rights and dignity for all people in the world. Tonight, our five speakers will share their vision of what might happen at the 2024 General Conference. As they speak, you can share comments and questions on the Zoom chat line, and my distinguished colleagues, Harvey Martz and Ben Rowe, will either answer your questions or forward them on to the speakers. Harvey was a distinguished senior pastor of St. Andrew United Methodist Church in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, before his retirement. He not only built a $40 million sanctuary complex, but led his large congregation in becoming one of the first and largest reconciling United Methodist congregations in this country. Ben has been in the forefront of LGBTQ plus advocacy for decades fearlessly witnessing his faith when others were afraid to stand for justice and equality in the church. All of us come together tonight with many questions. Will the next United Methodist Conference repeal its anti-gay policies that currently scar the church's polity and theology? Will it do more than reduce the harm that has been created? Will it shift to being pro-gay, advocating help for young persons who are bullied or transgender? Will it welcome same gender marriages and open our sanctuaries for same sex weddings? Will the church promote human rights policies around the world or in the name of anti-colonialism become silent in the face of injustice? Will we support our gay siblings around the world or maybe just in our own hometowns? Tough questions. No easy answers, but we'll look to our speakers tonight to give us insights and perspectives. Our speakers, play and clergy are experienced leaders in our denomination with great experience with past general conferences and who are deeply involved in planning for the upcoming general conference in 2024. The flow of speakers will move with introductions coming in reverse. And now my piece of paper slipped away and I don't have the names of the speakers, which is very strange what that's what happened uh, to my surprise. So I will speak uh, of verbatim. First, in reverse order, we will uh, have as our fifth speaker, Karen Prudenti. Karen is uh, from the Philippines where she's the director of the foundation there. She's a lay delegate uh, from New Jersey at various general conferences, but involved with the women's division, uh, the women's work of the United Methodist Church. She'll join us by video and perhaps uh, in person, depending on her plane schedule this evening. Uh, next, uh, as we're going in reverse order, will be Reverend Dr. Betty Kadzadzi, uh, who is the Director of Communications in the Congo, and we're very grateful for her. It is uh, 2 a.m. Uh, there. She had to get up at 1 o'clock in the morning and join us live. Uh, and so she is truly a wonderful participant. And we uh, feel deeply grateful to having Betty with us this evening and uh, wonder if we would have enough uh, 
uh, energy and support uh, and uh, willingness to come on at two in the morning. So we know uh, how much we appreciate her. Uh, we will have then uh, in reverse order, Jeremy Smith, who is the pastor in Seattle, who will give us a generalized perspective on what's uh, happening in the church. He's the author of the popular blog, uh, Hacking Christianity, as well as the senior pastor of the church in, in Seattle. Dave Knuckles will be speaking to us as one of the prominent lay leaders of United Methodism. He is the co conference leader in Minnesota and has a broad, extensive experience in various levels of the church. And we will be keynoted by Bishop Karen Alavito, who is the Episcopal leader of the Mountain Sky area. These speakers are wonderful leaders who have given their life and their service to the church and their place, and they will be able to give us perspective. Historically, what happens at a general conference is that uh, the Episcopal address is given by one of the bishops, followed often by the uh, speech by lay leader. So that's kind of the order we're going to go in tonight. We're going to start uh, with uh, our bishop. Uh, each of the speakers speaks their own mind. They're not uh, obligated to speak for anybody else, and we're eager to hear their voice and their vision. So I welcome, first of all, uh, my beloved Bishop, Karen Alavito. Thank you so much, Don. So grateful for you and especially for Umark for once again bringing together people from across our beloved denomination to learn from one another. You all continue to provide the right thing at the right time. And I'm so very grateful. And I know Robin is so very grateful for all you have done and continue to offer, not just me and us personally, but the entire church at such a critical time. And I have to tell you, I confess that I found the title for tonight's webinar to possess a little bit of wry humor. 2024 a potentially momentous general conference. What could you possibly mean by this? So I broke it down a bit as I thought about what I'll say. Conference is a term we United Methodists love. We love to conference. We holy conference. We annual conference. We jurisdictional conference. We church conference. We charge conference. And yes, we even general conference. General Conference is that once every four-year gathering of delegates from across the church, half clergy, half laity, for what is primarily a legislative meeting in which those delegates consider hundreds and hundreds of petitions related to our Book of Discipline, which then orders the life of the church from pastors to local churches to general agencies, as well as sets official positions on a variety of subjects. In fact, General Conference is the only body that can speak for the United Methodist Church. Interesting that it only meets every four years. A bishop doesn't speak for the church. We can only interpret what General Conference has set for the church. So tonight, we're talking about 2024 General Conference, which is really 2020 General Conference happening not one year, not two years, not three years, but a whole quadrennium after it should have been held. One that has been described as potentially momentous. The dictionary defines momentous as, quote, having great or lasting importance, consequential, significant. Every general conference is momentous because, as I said, it orders our life together. Each one is consequential because as votes are cast over petition after petition after petition, our shared life takes new shape and form, new boundaries are created, and roles are redefined. But some are more momentous than others. The first conference was the one John Wesley called it in 1744, which birthed the holiness movement known as Methodists. In 1784, clergy in the colonies gathered at Lovely Lane Chapel in Baltimore, Maryland, and a new church was formed, the Methodist Episcopal Church. At the 1792 conference, they decided to hold this general conference every four years. 
16 years later, or four quadrennia, our church's constitution was adopted in 1808. At the 1800 General Conference, the Methodist Episcopal Church issued a pastoral letter on abolishing slavery and passed, and passed legislation that no Methodist preacher should be a slaveholder or slave trader. We know that tensions around this grew in the church, which ultimately resulted in a schism between the ME Church and the ME South. It was the 1956 General Conference that approved full clergy rights for women. But we're here today because of other general conference decisions that have had a dire impact on the well-being of LGBTQ persons as well as the whole church. These have been no less momentous. In 1972, general conference passed a motion which added the following statement to the denomination's social principles. That said, it sounded so nice. Homosexuals no less than heterosexuals are persons of sacred worth who need this ministry and guidance of church and their struggles for human fulfillment. I mean, it was so beautiful. But then at the floor, it was added, however, we do not condone the practice of homosexuality and consider this practice incompatible with Christian teaching. We have been living with this that has framed our understanding of working with LGBTQ people ever since. 1976 General Conference adopted reports which stopped any funding of gay lesbian support groups with church money. 1980, a motion was proposed to add the phrase, no self-avowed practicing homosexual therefore will be ordained or appointed in the United Methodist Church. It failed to pass, thank goodness. Later it came to pass at another time. In 1984, they passed fidelity in marriage and celibacy and singleness. In 1988, the General Conference created a committee to study homosexuality that would then help inform the 1992 General Conference. It was interesting because they established a list of categories for the committee membership in order that it would be truly inclusive. But guess what? Guess whose voice, guess whose presence was missing? Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, United Methodists were not allowed to join the committee. In 1992, the committee was able to reach a consensus on four items. The seven references to homosexuality in the Bible represent ancient culture and not the will of God. They cannot be taken as definitive. Two, homosexuality is a normal sexual variation which can be healthy and whole. Three, covenantal, committed, and monogamous homosexual relationships should be affirmed. Four, these conclusions are supported by God's grace, which is visible in the life of lesbian and gay Christians. So the majority report recommended that the church cannot responsibly maintain the condemnation of homosexual practice. A minority report recommended that actually we do consider homosexuality incompatible with Christian teaching. The report was received by General Conference but was not approved. They did modify the Book of Discipline to state, we insist that all persons, regardless of age, gender, marital status, or sexual orientation, are entitled to have their human and civil rights insured. I just guess not their ecclesiastical rights. In 1996, the General Conference was held and voted that ceremonies that celebrate homosexual unions shall not be conducted by our ministers or conducted in our churches. But the conference did pass a resolution, and you'll remember this was the era of don't ask, don't tell, which the church took on for LGBT members, but said the U.S. military should not exclude persons from service solely on the basis of sexual orientation. The year 2000, we continued to see, uh, actually it was a, a proposal that actually was rejected that almost required a litmus test by clergy, a loyalty oath that said, uh, I do not believe that homosexuality is God's perfect will for any person. I will not practice it. I will not promote it. I will not allow its promotion to be encouraged under my authority. Thankfully, that bright light, it, it was rejected 705 to 210. But interesting, some United Methodists started to su suggest a schism in the denomination James Heidinger, the uh, editor of the Good News magazine, commented, quote, 
Is an amical departure a better option than continuing to tear away the fabric of our denomination? We're pained at their pain. And we don't want to be unloving in our response. But I don't see a middle ground here. In 2004, uh, again, we actually wound up even codifying more deeply that no funds would be used to, to not just support gay groups, but even fund anything um, that would promote homosexuality. And however, perhaps the most momentous general conference was the 2019 special call session. It was highly anticipated that this body would adopt the recommendation from the Commission on the Way Forward. While the committee studied several proposals to bring it forward, it was the one church plan that would provide a gracious space for differences around human sexuality and reduce harm to LGBTQ people. But what happened? Through slick use of legislative process, the traditionalist plan, which tightened anti-LGBTQ rules for both queer people and their allies, was approved by the body. Now, I believe, and I think the General Secretary of Archives is with us tonight, I think we're gonna be studying this special session for decades because it added fuel to the fire of a church that used to be strangely warm, but had grown rather lukewarm. Parishioners across the connection were stunned at the punitive turn the church had taken from grace and the overt hostility and rejection of LGBTQ people. It, it, it showed some had never heard or known of the church's position on LGBTQ people for the previous 45 years. So a plan to turn the United Methodist Church away from its historic social justice commitment through a carefully crafted and well-funded plan backfired, in part because of the great societal changes regarding LGBTQ people in the last decade. Suddenly, once, LGB, once, suddenly, once closeted LGBTQ people came out and they got married, and the person in the pew recognized their beloved choir member, the kid who always helped out at everything the church did, their own son or daughter as being LGBTQ. And to have the church so violently reject them, poked a mama bear. Instead of traditionalists pushing out conservatives, centrists, and progressives, they found themselves a minority voice with no social capital to move the church to a more traditionalist way. As we watch churches leave the denomination, it is not a schism so much as a dribble with even fewer of those churches moving to the traditionalist GMC. Which now brings us to 2020, or is it 2024, General Conference. A major saint of this conference and LGBTQ United Methodists is Julian Rush, whose hymn in the midst of new dimensions, new dimensions is in the hymn book, minus one verse. It is so telling that the United Methodist Church chose to omit this verse. It goes like this. Through the years of human struggle, walk a people long despised, Gays and lesbians together, fighting to be realized. Will this general conference truly be momentous and lead the church away from its sin of exclusion and be a place where all people are welcome, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity? Will we confess the harm we've done to foster hatred, fear, and yes, even violence against LGBTQ people? Will we be able to remove the harmful language about homosexuality, which the Commission to Study Human Sexuality recommended 30 years ago? I mean, I just have to stop. And I think of all the harm the church has done, how many lives we've lost because we refused to listen to a group of people who studied this deeply on behalf of the church. Will it finally accept their recommendation that the church cannot responsibly maintain the condemnation of all homosexual practice. 
You know, there are people who are going to be talking to you who are such, I mean, they love, they love to do this political work. I mean, we can talk about the changing makeup of general conference delegates, especially given the wave of disaffiliations. We can study the, the voting patterns of the delegates. We can begin to hypothesize what the body might do. But the bigger question for me is this. Do we have the will to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, which as we know, we've seen it in the Bible, we've seen it in our own lives. Whenever the Holy Spirit shows up, it always enlarges the circle of faith, always brings in more those who have been pushed out of the circle and helps us recognize siblings in Christ that we've overlooked before. Will we commit ourselves to do no more harm? Will we make church a place where every person will know that they're not only welcomed, but they are celebrated and encouraged to grow into their God-created self? I don't have the answer, but I'm praying. I'm praying that this potentially momentous general conference is a transformational one that helps the church become a beacon, a beacon of hope and healing, a beacon of courage and compassion, a beacon of justice and joy as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Well, okay, I'm, uh, I don't relish following Karen. But I am going to do a good service to my friend Jeremy because I know he likes to have wonderful graphics on his blog. So I assume the slides, and I wanted to have have him have a very low bar for the slides I'm putting up. But um, I appreciate y'all being here, and um, I apologize for using the slides. That that this is how I can keep on track. Well, um, I'm missing a slide that just has my name and contact information, and I would like to be available if any of you want to follow up with me, uh, particularly around general conference organizing. But I do think there will be breakthroughs in the 2024 general conference. Um, but I need to start my talk, friends, uh, by commenting about general conference. Um, I believe that general conference as an institution has been quite dysfunctional for decades. And it has been unable to solve important problems for the church time and time again. And the political processes that come to bear have often uh, twisted it um, to not be really wholly compensating, but politics that looks like U.S. Congress. So I, I am a delegate, but I start from a proposition that general conference is dysfunctional. And I don't think a successful general conference or any changes to the book of discipline is really the primary goal for my ministry of uh, church politics. It's not the measuring stick because you can often be disappointed by a particular general conference. And if you just organize and then be disappointed in the walk away, you'll miss an opportunity to build over the conferences over the years and uh, sustain a trajectory of progress. And I think we are at a precipice that 2024 could be 
a historic transition point, but what exactly, it, it's hard to promise. Um, I also wanna say General Conference is not just a 10 day event, it's a multi-year season preparing and implementing, and that will be very true in this case. So uh, just understand those are my perspectives on General Conference generally. I have these predictions. I think that um, for the American church and for uh, uh, the Western world church in general, we'll see coming out of this period from 2019 in the aftermath of the disaster in St. Louis through 26, we will be living and growing into an inclusive vision. And I encourage you to think about what your part of that is. Sure, for the general conference, if you're uh, interested in those processes, but more important in the life of your local church and your conference, because that's where we've made much progress and have more progress that we can continue to do regardless of general conference. Um, my second prediction will is that we will enact a change in our policy to be more regional, regional as a body. And I think that is the key to saving the worldwide connection. I don't think we can be a worldwide church unless we make an alteration and I am encouraged with, with the progress. The third prediction is the newly revised social principles will be enacted at this general conference. And this will be a great unifying instrument for our church moving forward. And I'll talk about why. Now, a process prediction is that you will see your 2024 general conference delegates be very organized, unified, and effective in ways that have not been in evidence in past general conferences, partly due to um, much of the um, WCA group will have already left, but more importantly, towards effectiveness, is will be a united on the vision of the continuing uh, church, and that will be a help to the uh, church back home. And my last point is, I think there will be good things coming out of GC24, but your conference can do better than general conference. And I'll talk about that, and I have faith that you'll be able to do that. So let me talk about um, how the church becomes inclusive over this uh, seven-year period, through 2019 through 26. What does that mean? Um, we got galvanized after St. Louis. The reaction to the traditional plan demonstrated for the first time that progressives that had been advocates for inclusion and not knowing how, um, where we stood. I mean, I don't think we had a majority in 2012 when I first started attending general conference, but it was always hard to tell. And the reaction to the traditional plan showed that the center of the church was with us. You could say, if you're an obnoxious person like me, that was obvious after St. Louis that we had won the uh, battle for the heart and soul of the church in America. It didn't feel very good at the time. And plenty of uh, gay folks, uh, and I'm a parent of two queer young adults, were harmed by the failure to get over the goal line but it was also clear, at least to me from an organizer's perspective, that uh, we will ultimately prevail. There has been a growing um, 
support for gay clergy and same-sex marriage and conducting weddings in many conferences. Uh, many boards of ordaining ministry have stated official policies to uh, welcome and certify gay candidates. This is not a privilege enjoyed in all conferences. We need to keep working towards that, but as a trend, we've seen a lot more open ordination and a lot more bishops that are not willing to uh, prosecute people for performing gay weddings. Again, not a privilege that is secure in every place, but um, since you've already heard me say I don't count on general conference, it's important to organize uh, locally. Um, and by boom, I meant the boards of ordaining ministry that certify, uh, I recommend people for ordination. I was very uh, hopeful um, and pleased by the level of organization by the delegates at the five jurisdictional conferences in 2022. And we passed uh, meaningful uh, resolutions on topics like inclusion and anti-racism and topics like uh, eliminating conflict of interest from the church uh, and meaningful legislation around regionalization, recommending the Christmas covenant or uh, something uh, similar to that. That had never been done before. That a, a unified statement on several important topics could be passed in every jurisdiction covering America. And there are lessons that we can take from this. And in terms of building an inclusive church, it's like, well, let's live into what those delegates voted, not what St. Louis voted. Let's live in and work beyond what those delegates voted, no matter what we find happens in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, encourage that the bishops have uh, made relatively good progress on articulating the vision for the United Methodist Church and that the communications agency has come behind that and done great work on this BUNC campaign. We have a critical need to uh, rally around a common identity of who we are as the continuing United Methodist Church. I think that campaign has been helpful, and there are a lot of tools that your annual conferences could use. Many do, and some uh, don't, and it's there for, for the use. I've said that uh, we'll get some, to some regional governance in 2024. What does that mean for you on the ground? We're already living in a regionalized church, meaning we've already responded to our context in different places regardless what the rules say we need to fix the book of discipline we need to make it official we need to uh, do so much and that's why i'm invested in doing that work but i think there's a widespread recognition that we are already regional in how we approach things and um, i want to further live into that. And that's what I see the church being. Um, and encourage you, this is the uh, a call to action. It's nice to check in and hear about general conference, but there are things you can do. And I, I encourage you in that way. And remember, um, well, I'll, I'll take the next slide to, to take up, but remember, regionalization, uh, I think, that is going to preserve the global connection and don't think we'll have a global connection if we can't get to regionalization. The stakes are just that high. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we've identified the four regions as US, Africa, Europe, and the Philippines. And ideally, in each region, they will have a regional identity 
that is most appropriate for their context, while also having a global identity be you know, unified uh, as UMC, but uh, will by identifying these regions and having them be equal, not say US versus central conferences or jurisdictions versus central conferences. This is a big step forward in decolonizing. <laughs> regions will have some authority to legislate and act unique to their region. Um, they can contextualize their local conference structures the way a local church works is different in um, various parts of the world and it needs to be. And ministerial standards would be another example of something that's tailored to the cultures in the regions. Uh, and importantly, this is where we have, uh, have a problem with ordination of uh, LGBTQ individuals and a region would be able to make that work in that region, even if other regions don't agree. And there would be other aspects on how to uh, structure the, you know, ordering the church and the discipline of the church that would be appropriate to a region. And we in the US would be maintaining charges and trials for some of the things that have riled us up. And I hope um, an aspect of regionalization would be a, a better sense of healthy mutual respect for uh, each other across the And as we become regional, we would still have points of unity coming from our connectionalism, our theological essentials, but not legislate uniformity on every uh, matter of uh, culture. We would be unified in our uh, method, uh, encouraging social holiness, uh, personal holiness, social justice. My pet peeve is people confusing social justice with social holiness. They're both important <laughs> um, and not quite the same thing. The episcopacy can be an instrument of unity and what we do through our general agencies can be an instrument of unity. To, lifting uh, all boats but this regionalization is a big huge thing and i would imagine that karen prudente and betty kazadi will talk more ab about this um the proposed social principles are a big deal you know um we have believed in the social gospel for quite some time it's a distinctive part of our history I think we were the first one to have an articulated statement of social principles in 1908. But if in fact, uh, Ashley Bogan from Archives and History is on the call, she'll be quick to correct me. But I think that's an important part of who we are. And I, in talking to delegates that come from the Philippines and Africa, that our social principles are important part of their connection to us. This is an important part of the church in those contexts. Um, those societies are sometimes um, less free or less um, mobility given the governmental structures and history and um, uh, poverty and so forth. And so having these social principles articulated by a global church is a great source of inspiration and direction. My experience, every um, person I meet from Africa that might have been very traditional and would not be welcoming to my children some number of years ago, if they have been able to come to a place of uh, affirmation, their gateway has been looking at the world through social principles. And it is the case that our current social principles are too US centric. So they don't resonate across the world as much as they could. And some errors that we've made as a legislative body have weaponized social principles. And the 
first entry of incompatible with Christian teaching was in a social principle in paragraph, I think, 161. And it's been weaponized to um, punish people. It's been weaponized to twist our doctrine. And so these past errors are things that we need to uh, correct. And our global board of church and society has done a great job of revising the social principles. It's been the most widespread grassroots participation. It's not controlled by a, just a few bishops revisioning. It really expresses who we are. There's been more central conference participation in this than any other thing. And um, in my opinion, it's kind of fresh, uh, elegantly written, and it will help us unify on the essentials. And so it's a very exciting thing. Um, they exist. They're compatible with the BUMC messaging. There are tools you can use in your local annual conference to get people talking, and uh, it will incline people to greater inclusiveness. My fourth prediction around organization, and I, I, Don, you'll have to tell me if I'm taking too long, but um, our delegates are seasoned and frustrated and tired by the delays. But in fact, we are seasoned. And now the people going to general conference will have already been in jurisdictional conference before general conference rather than the other way around. And we learned how to organize virtually better. We are more connected as a US group. And when you look at the resolutions we passed in a uniform fashion across all conferences, shows you that uh, we've learned something about organization that will be really important if we want to come out of uh, 24 with some good changes in some unity and momentum, um, which I'm hopeful for. So my prediction is we'll continue to be organized. Um, we've learned how to collaborate with bishops and running uh, the legislative work to be more effective. And um, um, I wanted to move on to the central conference. Central conferences are better organized with the mileage varies quite a bit in, in different places, but I would note that the primary proposal for regionalization, the most robust proposal came out of the Philippines and it was first passed by a Philippine annual conference to submit it to general conference. This is very rare and groundbreaking really to see the central conferences get involved in that way. And it's such an important piece of legislation. The people have, have done that, have gone on to organize across the region. So people from all corners of the globe are really involved. And I gotta say, I'm on the connectional table and we have uh, a, a, a step towards regionalization that we had proposed well before the Christmas covenant got going, um, but we have uh, not been able to organize and educate half as well as they have. So I'm very hopeful that that effort is going to lead to more cross-delegate communication so we don't have uh, unpleasant surprises and inability to get an important thing done. And the last thing I would mention is uh, a recent formation of a grassroots group in Africa, the United Methodist Africa Forum. And I think um, Betty uh, could talk about this. I hope she will. It's a group that is committed to unifying the church in Africa and staying UMC across the worldwide connection. And to have that kind of uh, group be talking about things before general conference gives us a chance to have a better success at general conference. <clears throat> and because some of these proposals require constitutional amendments would, that would be ratified in the annual conference, and Africa would be a, a big question mark, there's a lot of good that could come from this effort. 
<clears throat> and lastly, this this comes uh, uh, a little bit back to the beginning. You know what you can do. So we'll get some things done, but you can do it better based on some of these things are already talked about. Would encourage people to uh, attend to um, collaborating between the grassroots leaders on a conference level and don't you no longer have to feel you're oppositional to your bishops we have a a, a a largely supportive group of bishops for the work of inclusion so work to make better progress attend to the nominations and elections process uh, in north central jurisdiction for example we paid attention to uh, having LGBTQ people on committees on investigation and uh, committees on appeals. And if you won't participate in persecution of uh, prosecution of people, you basically you know, nullify the jury. That's a powerful tool. So you can do that no matter what happens at the general conference. And um, obviously every place is different. So you're the best ones to know. So that's my spiel. I apologize, Don, I, if I talk too long or too slow, but I'm open to hearing from people uh, anytime. Texting my cell phone is the best way, and I'm particularly keen to um, be talking to more uh, delegates or people that are trying to interact with their delegations. Thank you, Dave. You have uh, laid out uh... A, a real uh, agenda for us to think about. You will see in the chat questions and, and questions and answers that people are asking. Uh, we'll come back to those later uh, as the program proceeds, but you have certainly stimulated our thoughts. We are going to move to the video from Karen Prudente now, uh, as soon as that can be brought up on the screen by our technician. Uh, and then we will go on to Betty, who's standing by uh, uh, in the middle of the night in, in the Congo, uh, waiting to talk to us. But let's have the video at this time. A potentially momentous general conference can happen, I believe, only if some of these conditions are available. That those who have left and are deciding to to depart, the United Methodist Church are no longer part of any leadership seats and decision-making processes of our de renewed denomination. That those of us who will remain in the United Methodist Church are truly open and respectful to the diversity and beauty of our theological beliefs as we travel together towards spiritual maturity in connectional relationships that we do not harm each other even if we do not see eye to eye on certain topics that we remind each other that we are all children of god finding ways to thrive our very best since god promised that this is possible through mission opportunities and creative worship experience we each transform ourselves and bring new disciples who will join the united methodist church and finally, that those of us who stay must trust and love each other so that we can hold each other's hands as we go through the wilderness together. So what is possible this General Conference 2024? And that it may be momentous. You know, regionalization has been tried more than 15 years ago, but it wasn't ratified. It was approved, but not ratified. But I think conditions are different today and that regionalization can pass and that can happen through the christmas covenant legislation that decolonizes the united methodist church from being a u.s centric denomination that this will be one of equity and of real contextual uh, realities that are in the regions and that the, the u.s regional conference will also happen and that we agree that there are items that are non-negotiable in the Book of Discipline and our Constitution, like our doctrine and certain creeds, that we are no longer a one-size-fits-all church 
where we freeze God like an ice cube, but enable God's unconditional love to abound with the Holy Spirit that guides us. Regionalization must pass not only at GC24, but in the following annual conference gatherings so that we aggregate the two-thirds vote to amend our constitution so that, again, a U.S. regional conference is empowered like the current regional regions currently called the central conferences. Regionalization does not change or impact the local churches or people in pews. It is structural. It doesn't impact the uh, amounts approved by, to the agencies that remains with the connectional table and GCFA. The Christmas covenant creates equity in how our worldwide denomination decides how mission opportunities and initiatives are, are by the region and for the region and that items in the general conference only handle topics that are worldwide and matter to the church. The Christmas covenant includes a study which can recommend improvements to regionalization that cannot be tackled at GC 2024. New legislation at GC 2026 can deal with it, these items that the regions see fit in our evolving United Methodist movement. This might include economic equity and perhaps even, you know, the, the removal of jurisdictional conferences, which some believe have been harmful to the denomination. So these are changing times, but we must be open to it. But I believe that through Acts 1, 1 11, that states that we must be wait, what we must wait, that we must be patient, for the promise of the Father is on the way, and that more power is on the way through the Holy Spirit. The mission of the Holy Spirit will guide us and kick us into high gear for the unity of the renewed United Methodist Church to be revitalized and reclaimed as we fulfill our mission journeys together here on earth with God's love, and again, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for that inspiring speech, uh, Karen. And I believe she is on live with us now. She has made her uh, connection from the airport to a location. Uh, I can't see her on my screen, but she has told me she's there. Uh, can we connect her at this time? I'm presuming we are not yet able, there's, uh, we're not able to do it quite yet, uh, but uh, I think she'll join us uh, for questions and answers uh, here uh, uh, later. So we will keep in touch and now we welcome our friend from the Congo. Uh, it must be uh, two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning for you, Betty. Uh, so Reverend Doctor, we're most honored to have you. Thank you for extending this opportunity to me at such a time like this. I know it is too late here in Tamina, almost uh, 3 a.m. And um, as an African delegate, the general conference, GC 2020 that postponed for 2024, a potentially momentous for me as an African is that, what do I bring at the table as an African? Do I speak my own mind or I speak somebody's mind or I am manipulated. 
I think this potentially momentous is to speak my own mind that I was, I am, and I will be United Methodist. I, I remain and I stay United Methodist in my own context, my own context of Africa, my own context of uh, Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, my own context of North Katanga Episcopal leader. This is really important because as a woman, as a leader, as a clergy, no one will manipulate me. Because when we come, we attend the general conference. The impression is, what can an African bring at the table? But we bring at the table our own mind. We bring at the table mutual respect. We bring at the table mutual responsibility by encouraging other delegates to the general conference to support the unity of the church within the context, within the region, because we have been doing ministries and missions within our own context. Because we don't want to copy and past US politics in an African context or in an African church. Because we have our own issues. As an African, how do we conf how do we bring our own issues and confront them together in our own context? This is very important. That is where, as an African leader, we support, we are part of the Christmas covenant legislation. This is the hope for the UMC where we do mission within the context because in any situation, context is very important. We speak our faith within our own context. That is why what we do today, we do evangelism within our context. We do social work within the context because it is well understood when the mission is done within the context. When I go to the remote rural areas, looking at the current situation of the church, when you talk to different leaders about this affiliation, they don't know anything about this, this, this affiliation. What they know is to do mission and ministry evangelism in their own context. Context is very important. That's why we invite other delegates to support the Christmas covenant because the Christmas covenant will help delegates to do the, their mission within their context. And we really support the unity of the church as an African delegate, because I remember last time we met in, uh, in South Africa as um, uh, a group of uh, uh, United Methodist Africa uh, delegates forum. We started this forum whereby we need to speak our mind as African delegates. Let's speak our own issues that is really affecting the Africa, uh, African context. And we really encourage within this forum, 
other African delegates to reclaim, to revive and to renew our own ways of doing mission and ministry within our own context. That will be very easy to understand where we are coming from, where we are, and where we are going. A potential moment for us is to bring something at the table, the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, Please, it is open to everybody. Come as a child of God, of the church together, but that will save. We continue responsibility in building the kingdom of God. Thank you. Thank you. That was powerful and uh, the, the miracle of technology and, and it's very best. Uh, thank you. Uh, not only for the technology, but for the profound theology that you shared, Reverend Doctor. And uh, this will lead us further into our conversation. Uh, after Reverend Jeremy Smith has a chance to speak, we're going to uh, invite uh, Karen Prudenti and others to join in the open discussion. Uh, Jeremy? Uh, thank you, Don and Harvey and uh, Umark. I just learned how to pronounce it today. Um, and all the behind the scenes folks um, uh, and me coming at the at the end is a perfect example that we do not always save the best for last. Uh, but I'm glad to be included anyway. Um, as a preacher, I can I only think in terms of metaphors. So metaphors be with you. Um, a year ago, I had a back injury. If you have three kids under age 10, like I do, and you don't practice self-care, you're going to have a back injury. But when I was doing physical therapy, the PT guy gave me the state of United Methodist Church in a sentence. The physical therapist did, not a preacher, not even a Methodist. You see, I had pain on my uh, right side of my back that I was treating with hot and cold and all the different things and nothing was working. But the PT guy checked things out and he said, the injury is actually on the left side of my back and that it was constricting the muscles and pulling my spine and causing pain on the right side. And then his sermon in a sentence was, the pain is not where the problem is. You hear that? You know, I, I see fellow presenters nodding. The pain is not where the problem is. Uh, what has been swirling for me um, is that there's a lot of pain in the United Methodist Church right now. We have the pain of disaffiliation, the pain of churches where we were baptized or married or buried a loved one, uh, leaving for more unaccountable pastures, um, the pain of winnowing of the church funds and resources to enable more resilient ministries, and we have the pain of continuing to be in a church that excludes people from marriage and ordination and funding and representation. These are painful things, but the problem is in the unjust laws found in the Book of Discipline. Our document that shapes our common life together has been twisted over the past several decades, as Bishop Karen shared, by people who have now exited millions of dollars of property and tens of thousands of people from the United Methodist Church. The pain of disaffiliation is not the problem. The problem is a few lines in the Book of Discipline have caused much of this pain, and it's up to General Conference to fix the problems of exclusion, of inequality across our regions, of not giving enough time for local context needs, like Reverend Dr. Betty said, and being consumed by misplaced global uniformity. So as, um, as we conclude our conversation today, I, I, I just hope that we turn our energies and our work towards organizing to participate in the process of general conference. And so that we can deal with the problem and not be consumed by the pain. Recently, I was talking with 
Uh, Derek Scott the third, he's the co lay leader of the Florida Annual Conference. Um, and about the remarkable ways that that conference has organized in the face of very personal disaffiliation and disruptive movements. He had some great wisdom that justice is a marathon on paper, but in practice, it really is a bunch of sprints. And progressives show up for sprints even when the progressives wear on us. We hit a sprint after the last general conference in 2019 uh, that gave us the most progressive and inclusive jurisdictional delegation in decades. As Dave Knuckles said, it allowed us to elect a full slate of progressive and inclusive bishops in America. Amen. Um, uh, that, that urgency created something good, and it woke the centrists from their slumber. And then we've had a couple of years where we've been caring for relationships during the pandemic, waiting for the general conference opportunity to come. Our limbs are weary from readying for that sprint. Um, it sometimes feels lonely, uh, like an entire generation of leaders is missing who we're used to seeing. So how do we get to feel ready for a general conference? We've got a lot of information here tonight. How, uh, how do we participate in a level um, where we feel like we are good at this again. Intersectionality is hard and fragile and a lot harder than the strong men telling us what to do. There's a lot of sprints behind us and a lot of sprints ahead of us, um, but the work really begins tonight, as over the next six weeks, we have conferences that are electing substitutes to replace delegates who are no longer able to serve after their hyperextended four years beyond their expectation. Uh, some have died, some have transitioned from laity to clergy, and some have disaffiliated. Um, let me just give a, a concrete example um, behind um, some of the things that Dave said. Um, let's look at my native roots of Oklahoma. The Oklahoma Annual Conference has 14 votes at General Conference, uh, seven, seven laity, seven clergy. At the election in 2019, I can assume from my own perception, um, even though I moved away 10 years ago, that about nine of the 14 were solid votes against full inclusion. But after disaffiliations and other transitions, um, some of those folks uh, disaffiliated, um, um, they were replaced by some more inclusive language, uh, laity from down ballot, um, and they even have to elect a new laity seated general conference delegate in a few weeks because they are out of reserves. So nine reliable anti-gay votes became five with one up for new election to make their delegation suddenly lean inclusive an impossibility four years ago. And that's just one conference. Imagine what else could be happening. For the rest of us, our delegations have shifted. There are new opportunities for relationships. The delegates who remain may be conservative, but they may not be the rabidly anti-gay traditionalists who voted in lockstep with their strongman leaders. There's a gap between being conservative um, and being so traditionalist that you chose to leave. For those of you in those conferences with those relationships, nurture those relationships and talk to folks. Um, I don't want to give you false hope. I was at General Conference in 2012 and we got a false hope about about change, and it hurt. It hurt badly. What I'm trying to say is that we are called to advocate for full inclusion now, to elect good delegates now, to pass resolutions now, to form relationships with delegates for the next year now, because we never know how the calculus might change. And how, just like it's only a five-seat difference, I think, in the House of Representatives in the USA Congress right now, it could be the same thing for United Methodism. And I'd hate for us to miss an opportunity. This is my uh, sixth general conference to attend. Um, and yes, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. But this isn't the same situation. And we aren't in the same church. And who knows what unbreaking can be found in the breaking of our church connections over the past year. We're a different church on the other side. There's a contemporary Christian song. You know, I get, you know, kind of get put PTSD whenever I think about it, but, uh, but it's by Switchfoot uh, that says, we want more than the wars of our fathers. And I would add mothers and parents. There's room in the discipline for disagreement, for a spectrum of beliefs, but we should be very clear that about, that, that we treat people with dignity again. 
Like several folks on this call, I was part of the All Belong effort in the West in 2019 that submitted changes to the paragraphs uh, to give a space to be the church. I know many other groups submitted changes. There's a ton of effort that was aspirational in 2019 that all of a sudden might be possible in 2024. We'll know more after annual conference season um, and after the delegations are firmed up. But we're a different church. We're called to live into that, and that takes bold action in a season where it feels like that we need, or where sometimes it feels like we need to diminish ourselves so that more people don't leave. Have you have you heard this or felt this? I, of course, won't speak for Bishop Karen, but I know that our bishops are under pressure to not rock the boat until after the disaffiliation deadline has passed, to not give more credence to the separatist narratives. And yet I hear of bishops in the South saying if a LGBTQIA plus candidate is sent to them by clergy session, they are gonna commission or ordain them. Yes, let your bishops know of your support for them to be bold now when it costs something and not later when it's too late. Derek Scott, um, he gave me this quote, said, those with leadership in any capacity need to show some moral courage and lead, don't placate lead. We can all do that at different capacities. Uh, now, um, I hate, I hesitate to comment on the revised social principles, but the circumstances under which they were written were very different than where we are now. Social principles that have stronger statements on uh, white supremacy, Christian nationalism, stronger statements on reproductive choice, those are the ones that I would love to see now in our new church, in a new context. Now, I will vote for the revised social principles as is to respect the great variety of voices in that conversation, but we are called to be bold and to participate in general conference as such, and we should seek it. Uh, in closing, I'll share a uh, quote from uh, my friend Tara Barnes at uh, with United with Women in Faith. Um, she said to me, quote, general conference is our decision-making body, whether we like it or not. Let's align behind some shared goals and work to accomplish them. It's okay to be good at General Conference. Do you hear that? It's not too late to be good at General Conference. It can feel overwhelming, but it's a task to which we are called. As Bishop Karen asked us at the beginning, will we listen to the spirit and care for those who have been pushed out of the circle? Like the parable of the workers in the vineyard, you who are listening may have started at 9 a.m. and been in this marathon for a long time. Some of you, like me, came in in the early afternoon, but the one who calls us to this work will keep calling you up until the 11th hour, until the last shred of daylight is on the horizon to elect delegates, to pass resolutions, to advocate and support for those who are advocating, and be present either in person or afar to hope the world is about to turn in 2024. I am excited about that work ahead and I'm excited to be working with you. Thank you. Thank you, that was uh, powerful as were the other speakers. We are now lead into a question and answer time, but uh, so I'm gonna invite all the speakers to turn on their uh, video cameras, but we're going to invite Karen Prudenti to uh, speak first uh, because uh, she's had her first chance to speak uh, uh, after a, moment, a momentous flight from Nashville to wherever she ended up. So welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, good morning, my dear sister, Betty. Thank you for staying up. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm back on the continent here in the United States. Uh, I've and spending more time in the Philippines also. And, and like Betty, um, Filipinos too have been uh, in the last general conferences also have been, you know, taken by the neck, tried to be convinced to vote for things that they may not believe in. Or, and, and so times are different, but uh, in the Philippines right now, uh, WCA definitely is, um, trying to uh, also disaffiliate many churches there, but so far we've only had 12, and may there not be many more. But we also have our own tensions within our own, uh, I'll call them regions, but they're more language regions in the Philippines. But I know that these are different times 
times, and Jeremy is correct. Um, I think these are brave times. We who go to general conference and are going to annual conference this year and next year, and even right after, hopefully with a special session to ratify regionalization, must do brave things and not have those who are on the edge of the church still trying to figure out which side they're at, or already have, but still remain. Don't let them take us, you know, we need to be bold and show them that we are United Methodists, that we are an inclusive church. Yesterday, one of the African bishops gave me an example that even the continent is changing. And at UMAF, there were very interesting conversations. But this one was pretty interesting about even Namibia, where the government says that if you are married in another part of the world or even on the continent as as a gay couple, they will recognize you in the country of Namibia. So for me, the, the continent is changing. And even in Uganda, uh, although they were do, uh, planning to do the stoning and all of that, but because of the PEPFAR money and development money, they are going to change the language uh, of, of that legislation. So. Um, it's a changing world and we need to just be bold and and really thrive where God really has tried for us to enable everybody to be their best selves as we journey together. And I believe that we as United Methodists can enable that and that even if people are leaving our church, I, for me, I find these opportunities for us to show who we are to people who haven't even met us yet because we are an incredible people. So thank you very much, Don. Well, thank you for your uh, uh, speaking and sharing and let's open this up to uh, others. Uh, we've had some questions that have been posed uh, uh, on the chat lines from our uh, very vast uh, number of people who are tuned in tonight watching. Who would like to speak? You have to turn off your, I uh, turn on your uh, video if it's, if it's off. Uh, I saw some earlier questions that were raised from people uh, about the next general conference. What, how do these elections happen? That was kind of one of the questions uh, raised. Uh, Jeremy, you could speak a little more to that. Uh, and how many of these votes do you think are gonna really happen across the country? Uh, thank you, Don. I was trying to find those numbers uh, this week and I regret that um, I haven't uh, got a firm, uh, firm uh, understanding of it. I'm certain that there are more Methodist nerdy people than me that are following it. Um, but um, it's not gonna be too many uh, new elections, um, but there have been a lot of shuffling of a lot of delegations, especially across the Bible Belt in the South um, as, uh, as uh, folks uh, disaffiliate um, uh, and uh, the, the, nor the, the North as well. Uh, so I think that um, the elections will happen just like a regular general conference election. It's just that they're electing uh, to fill empty chairs, but they're keeping the rest of the delegation. So um, in the, um, you know, so if you have seven delegates, but you only, uh, if you have seven positions, but you only have six delegates left in your pool, then you elect to um, elect them um, and then whoever else is behind them. So every conference is different, but it's just like a regular election process uh, for those conferences. Uh, my own conference is electing some reserves. Um, because we've had uh, some transitions. You know, there was a comment in the chat um, about what it's like to be that lone voice calling for inclusion. Bonnie Bryant, thank you for your note. Um, and how to stick with it, how to do it. Yesterday, I was I spoke at ILIF Seminary and uh, someone asked me the question, why do you stay? Why do you stay? And I... I this is what gives me hope and keeps me there. You know, when I was a kid, I had a church that loved me. 
that let me know God loves me unconditionally and accepts me unconditionally and continue to invest in me and other kids. You know, we were the, we were the misfits, the outcasts, but at church we weren't. And um, I had my call and it was affirmed. And it was only later that I realized that the larger church doesn't always embody that love and that acceptance. And I stick with it because I travel across the connection. I go to tiny little towns and I see kids longing to know God's love. And so I stick with it. It's, you know, until this past Council of Bishops meeting, I was the only queer out bishop. And just to keep showing up and be generous in love. I do it for those kids in those small communities. I want them to know there is a God who loves them. There's a community that accepts them and will do everything to help them grow into the person God wants them to be. So, Bonnie, thank you for your witness. We only have time for a couple questions. I have to be answered kind of quickly, but uh, one of the challenges that speakers have is you're so well informed, but the rest of us st still don't really know what you're talking about sometimes when you're talking about the Christmas conference or regionalization and so forth. One question is, will each area have its own discipline? Well, there, there is actually within the ADCA of uh, General Conference right now, a global book of discipline, which was uh, brought by the Standing Committee on Central Conferences. Right now, they want to hold that because hopefully regionalization passes because then they will have to adjust it based on the U.S. becoming part of that uh, legislation. So. That's why 2026 also is important in the evolving of the regionalization for the church. So um, it's possible that they may, might be eight different regional uh, book of disciplines, but the core will be an agreement of the United Methodist denomination where it will not be different. It'll be the same. Only contextual items will be different in that book of discipline. They will be local. Now, I wanted also to add on on another subject, which is basically the neutralizing of the, neg the negative language. And we've been uh, going around, and Betty might be able to also answer this, that it might be possible to at least remove the harmful language at this general conference. But we will see. Um, it is possible. I think we need to attempt to do that. Uh, Follow-up question, and probably the last one here. Is there a place where the rest of us can see the new social principles? This is not something that's widely known among uh, uh, United Methodists. Uh, I, I know the social principles been in process, but they've gotten lost. So we don't really know what these new social principles are. Yes, there is a place. I'm going to put a link in the chat. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we will thank each of the presenters for your uh, presentation. Obviously, we just opened up the subject tonight. Uh, General Conference is less than a year away now. And uh, we have heard tonight very vividly that the annual conferences coming up in our various areas are very crucial. Uh, we will be moving together to learn more and more about what the general conference is going to do and what we can expect. We're grateful for all of you who have joined us. Uh, uh, I'd like to tell you that UMARC uh, depends upon your support. Uh, I have a few slides up here to show you that if you want to contribute to become a sponsor, you can send a check. Uh, we make these uh, webinars free, uh, but we're grateful for the donations. It's the only way we operate. Uh, we are uh, looking forward to our own uh, 
annual conference. And when I say our own, that means the Mountain Sky, though our membership now is spread out across the country. Here are the legacy levels of gifts. Uh, we welcome you to uh, check out our website, which is www.umark.org. So in closing, let me uh, invite you to continue to check out our website, to be involved with UMARC as we expand across uh, the United States and the world. Uh, I wish all of you could join us at the Mountain Sky Conference, where we look forward to hosting Bishop uh, Cedric Bridgeforth as a speaker, along with our own Bishop Karen Alavito uh, at one of our dinners. But we will keep you informed about the developments here and as we together work uh, to change the church and make the church uh, truly inclusive as intended by our own constitution and what I think is the way and will of God. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the speakers. Uh, we look forward to future opportunities to be in dialogue with you. God bless you and may the Holy Spirit be with you.